So in James's estimation, there are worse things than being tongue-tied. There are times when the tongue can do so much damage. When the wagging tongue speaks what is better left unspoken, or when the lying tongue unleashes chaos, or when the angry tongue causes great hurt. When the religious leaders of his day put so much emphasis upon a strict avoidance of unclean food, as Judy mentioned during her time with the young, Jesus said to them, it's not when it enters a person's mouth that defiles them, but what comes out of a person's mouth. And when maybe we emphasize only eating the healthiest, most organic, least processed foods that have been declared by the latest studies as undefiled, Jesus might say to us, remember, it's not what enters so much as what leaves our mouth that defiles us. The little wisdom book of James in our New Testament is adamant, as you just heard Taylor read, about the dangers of what comes out of the mouth by way of the tongue. James writes, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. He writes, the tongue is a fire that can ruin worlds. It's a world of iniquity itself. No one can tame it, for it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So he was writing out of a, the early Christian community, and while we like to think that those early decades after, so close to when Jesus was walking on earth, were a golden age of, of church in one another's homes, worshiping and praying and sharing all things in common. From Paul's letter and books like James, we realize the bickering, the biting, the bitterness that inevitably arises in human community because it's human was there from the beginning. And James was encouraging his fellow Christians to put a cork in it, to bridle it, to rein in the tongue, understanding that the words we speak are a reflection of the faith we keep. They will know we are Christians, maybe by our more bridled tongues, not because we are better than other people, but because we are careful of the dangers of our own tongue and have worked to bridle it. Or have we? Somehow I'm afraid we Christians have, have missed this essential spiritual practice that both Jesus and James encouraged in us. James said quite clearly, which is a great statement for the day, be quick to listen slow to speak, and even slower to become angry. What a good mantra. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and even slower to become angry. It's been said in other ways, Gandhi saying, speak only if it improves upon the silence. I know it's ironic for me as a preacher to be saying this up here, but <laughs> speak only if it improves upon the silence. And then the British novelist, Marianne Evans, offers her own beatitude, blessed is he who having nothing to say abstains from giving us wordy evidence of the fact. <laughs> Some. Sometimes remaining silent is the best response, especially, especially in the face of unbridled gossip. Though it is hard to contain the wagging tongue when it begins wagging with other tongues, isn't it? Gossip sounds like the issue that middle school girls have, but 
we all have this tendency towards it. In fact, there are those who believe it is so great a tendency in the human being that it's, a, that it's part and parcel of what it means to have original sin. So let me explain. The idea is that we humans have this impulse or this susceptibility to try to bind ourselves to one another by speaking negatively of someone else. It's the external enemy over there that has this remarkable effect of co creating cohesion and attachment here. Do you know that? Right? I mean, that's, right? Well, what's more delicious than when you're connecting with someone about your frustration with someone else? And they're like, yeah. I know. I know they're like that. I know I'm glad we're in a, this group because that group is like that. So, fundamental human dynamic. In more technical terms, it is called, anthropologists have called it the scapegoating mechanism, of which we Christians say that Jesus was the ultimate and final one, the scapegoat, final scapegoat, in that he revealed in human consciousness what was before that point, a largely unconscious process where the group or the mob unites to one another by turning on a designated enemy who is actually, you know, an innocent victim. That was a revelation that came by way of the cross to human consciousness. This kind of awareness of that mechanism operating beneath the level of consciousness. Jesus played that role revealing this impulse in us. We come together over here by heaping our sins, our negativity onto another, and then as the, the Jewish temple practice at the time was quite literally, they, they heaped the sins prayerfully onto a goat and chased the goat out of town or sacrificed the goat on the altar. Thus, taking away the sins of the world. The anthropologist René Girard suggests it was the way that this is so fundamental, that it is the way human culture was first formed through this sacred violence against a scapegoat which bound the accusers of the scapegoat together in this remarkable unity. So this is deep, deep stuff within us and surfaces in the simplest of interactions as the warm, cozy feeling that I just described we have with someone else who dislikes another person with us or another group as much as we do. And it's a dynamic that plays out in the most complex global interactions where nationalism is stoked by a country having a con common enemy suddenly whether that is the Jews as the scapegoats in Nazi Germany or Iraq as the scapegoat in America's response to 9-11 or immigrants being the scapegoat of a country with a growing gap between the very rich and the working class poor. If we are attentive, we can watch it happening in the world around us and we can watch it happening out of our own mouths. Just note the next time you want to speak negatively about someone with someone else or want to gab about a situation that you really know very little about. Note what a pleasure it is and how effectively it binds you to whoever you're talking to, but at the expense of others. It is a sly and slippery and ubiquitous practice of the tongue that we must work at bridling because of the damage it can do. 
it is ultimately what killed our Lord. The chief priest Caiaphas saying, it is necessary for one to die for the sake of many. And the tongues of the swept up mob chanting, crucify him, crucify him. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Keeping silence can be a spiritual practice, knowing at times that our words do not, in fact, in this moment, improve upon the silence. What could it mean not to join in in that conversation, but to stay silent? Bridling the tongue is what we are called to. James calls us to it. Jesus calls us to it. Bridling the tongue is what we must do at times because for sure the human tongue does not just tell lies but can also convey the truth in critical ways. The human tongue not only insults by any means, it also praises and affirms. It not only wounds, it can build up. The tongue, of course, isn't just an instrument of hatred and scapegoating, it can also be an instrument of poetry and song and love. James says the same tongue that blesses God turns and can curse God's children. How is this? So it is a choice we have to bless or to curse. And it takes discipline to allow the virtues to flow out of us while bridling the darker elements of our souls, which can defile us and others. It helps us to find a still place. It helps to find a still place, to listen for God, to slow down enough to recognize the temptations of the tongue, the temptations to externalize a darkness that is within us or transmit a pain that is ours to bear or transfer a fear inside of us onto the other outside of us. In the words of the poet and lyricist John Greenleaf Whittier that the choir will sing here, so find it well and go for deeper rest in this still room. Then you'll find the habit of the soul feels less the outer world's control. You'll find the strength of human purpose pleads more earnestly our common needs in this still room. So be for a moment in this still room and let your tongue rest a while. So when you are ready to speak again, it is with words of grace and mercy, healing and truth. That our tongues may be tied, tied to Jesus' heart and form words that arise out of his love and his grace in his name. Amen.